We got him! Joining us now for the interview is the former governor of Maryland, now Democratic presidential candidate, Governor Martin O'Malley. Governor, it's great to have you here. Thank you for coming. Hey, thank you, us. Rachel. Good to be with you. I know you are a very busy man these days, so I really appreciate you taking this time. My pleasure. Um, what is your reaction to the Iran deal today? I think it's very promising. I have yet to read the 100-page agreement, but I believe and have long believed that a negotiated settlement is the best, best path forward here, provided that it is verifiable, it's enforceable, we cut off all paths to Iran's ability to develop a nuclear weapon. So I think there's a lot of promise here, and hopefully it is the beginning of a new day. One of the dynamics that I find very interesting, and it's true both about the Cuba deal and about the Iran deal now, is that in Washington, if you pay attention to the Beltway Press, you would think this is so controversial, it's on fire. Like, it's the, the, the president absolutely flouting public opinion and doing this crazy thing that everybody knows is nuts. Then you look at, that's the way the Beltway treats it, and that's the way it's talked about inside Congress in particular. Mm. Then you look at public opinion polling. American people love the Cuba d deal, love the, 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 the resumption of relations with Cuba. American people really want to deal with Iran. There's a really big difference on these international issues between what the people want and what Washington thinks is normal. What do you make of that? I, what I make of it is that the people of our country are actually ahead of their leaders, especially mm -hmm. on the national level. I mean, as I've traveled around the country, what I'm encouraged by is that when you talk to younger Americans under the age of 40, you rarely find people that deny that climate change is real. Mm -hmm. You rarely find people that want to discriminate against gay couples. And you rarely find people that want to bash immigrants or blame them for the nation's problems. So that tells me that our nation is actually moving in a much more connected, compassionate, and, and to a much more generous place place, and especially in our engagement in the world, people want us to be engaged, but they want us to be engaged in waging peace, looking for opportunities to collaborate with other nations to make this world a safer place. I, I think that's American common sense. Well, if that's, if that's true, if the people are ahead of, are ahead of the, 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 our supposed leaders in Washington, particularly on international issues and the kind of social issues that you were talking about, why is Washington so sclerotic? Why is Washington following so far behind on these issues? I mean, why is every Republican candidate for president saying if they don't want to change the U.S. Constitution to ban gay marriage, they'll do everything else within their power to ban gay, ban gay marriage? Why, are, why is Washington so far behind? Uh, I don't know. I think it's a couple of I think it's a couple of reasons. I mean, look, we have a very gerrymandered Congress. Yeah. We need to figure out a better way to draw our congressional district lines. And because they were drawn by uh, a lot of Republican governors, quite frankly, after the 2010 election, we have a House of Representatives that's not really very representative of mainstream America. And it, it tends to have a polarizing effect. And that's holding us back as a nation. It's mm -hmm. why you see, you know, broad support for things like marriage equality, why you see see growing support for immigration reform, and yet we still can't seem to get Not it done, even though it's in our nation's best interest because of the extreme way that congressional district lines are drawn. And, and I don't know a way to get through this except to have a deeper and better conversation in the course of a national election mm -hmm. about what's important to us as a people, what's in America's best interest. Right now, all across our country, people are sadly uh, very cynical that concentrated wealth has concentrated power in Washington and that we can't get things done anymore. And the two phrases I hear everywhere I go are the phrases new leadership and getting things done. We know we're all working harder, yet falling further behind. But and we also feel vaguely like it's almost not even a fair fight anymore. We can't even get our government to step up and regulate Wall Street properly to save us from another crash. And that makes people very frustrated and very angry. But uh, anger and frustration never built a great country. So I'm confident that uh, in the longer consideration here, as we approach the presidential election, that people will start asking the questions about which of the candidates in our party has the best shot of actually pulling people together, getting things done, and moving us out of these rather divided times. And that's what keeps me going. Do you think when you say need new leadership and the president that has the best prospect of getting things done. Is the, are you criticizing Hillary Clinton when you say that? Obviously, she's the all but prohibitive front runner uh, in this nomination, but it's a long fight still to go. Is she old leadership? Is she somebody who has, a, has, a, has some sort of record that you would criticize as not being able to get things done? 
Is Look, that the implicit claim there? I have a lot of respect for Secretary Clinton, and she'll be able to defend her own candidacy and advance it. I can tell you, for my part, what I have to offer in our party, where I'm looking forward to a robust discussion of not only the fact that so many of us hold progressive values, but that we can actually get things done, I'm going to advance my candidacy. And that is a new perspective. It is a younger perspective. It is the perspective of a new generation. And I was watching one of your pieces earlier, and one of the truths of these presidential primaries is that the inevitable front runner is inevitable, but only up until the first contest. Right, right. And the other truth is that whatever candidate is surging in, in the summer is not necessarily the candidate who's surging in January. People in Iowa and New Hampshire expect to see each one of us two, three, four times. They want to see us on our good days and our bad days and want to know that we have fresh ideas and the ability to move our country forward. And that's the process right now. Governor Martin O'Malley, I got to say, if I had to be a presidential candidate right now, I would rather be in your shoes facing the long odds against Hillary Clinton than I would be one of those guys at the bottom of the polls in the Republican side fighting Fox News for the right to even compete <laughs> for the nomination. Governor, hey, good luck to you. Thank you. It's great to see you. Thanks thank a you. lot. Will you come back? I absolutely will. Excellent. All right, we've got much more to come. Stay with us. Hey, YouTube fans, I'm Luke Russert. Thanks for checking out our MSNBC channel. Subscribe by clicking right here and click any of the videos over here to watch the latest breaking news, mini documentaries, conversations from Shift, and other digital exclusives. Check it out.